If you were part of Henry VIII's court here at Hampton Court Palace in the 16th century, this clock wouldn't have just been a thing of beauty. It would have told you everything you needed to know. The time, day and month for court business and pleasure, the times of the tides for travel to London, and the phase of the moon and position of the sun in the zodiac for predicting the future. I'm Susan Rowe. I'm a State Apartment Ward here at Hampton Court Palace. And since childhood, I've been fascinated by all things to do with space. And that's why the clock is my favourite item at the palace, and one which I think is often overlooked by the visitors. So come with me now and let's look at it from a different angle, one which you wouldn't normally see, from up on the roof. The clock comprises of three copper dials, each one rotating at a different speed relative to the other two. In the centre, this dial rotates once per month and shows us the phase of the moon and the time of the moon southing for calculating the tides. The central dial rotates once per year and shows us the age of the moon. The outer dial shows us the month, the day of the month and the position of the sun in the zodiac. In the centre you can see the earth and the sun rotates around us. So this is a pre-Copernican clock. This clock dates from around 1540 and is the work of two men, both named Nicholas. It was installed by Nicholas Orson, keeper of the King's Clocks, and designed by Nicholas Kratzer, the divisor of the King's Horologies. And at nearly three metres across, it would have been one of the biggest of this type in the world. The clock is so high up, so the King could get the best view of his clock from his apartments opposite. It's at the centre of the palace, so only the most important visitors would get to see it. So let's go now and have a look behind the dials. This clock tells a fascinating story of the Tudor view of the world, keen to understand it through science, yet still hanging on to beliefs about predicting the future. Kratzer would have forecast the weather and calculated the tides, but he would also have been responsible for forecasting the King's horoscope, something that was a potentially treasonable offence, spying by witchcraft. For the past 500 years, this clock has overlooked all the transformations here at the palace and all the changing fortunes of its inhabitants. You can still see the clock here today as a visitor and you can join me several times a year to learn more about this fascinating story. I'm from a city called Milwaukee which is a few hours north of Chicago and uh, we are also a famous place for beer. So when I was looking around Europe and deciding where I was going to go to next. I was like, I need a beer country. Uh, so I came here. I also lived a year in the UK as well. Um, but yeah, my background, um, I'm, a t I, I'm a teacher, and my uh, degree is in medieval history. So I absolutely love talking about history. Uh, and if you want to have some more information, just come on up during the tour. If you have a question, I could probably talk your ear off about uh, the history of frogs. But what we're going to do, we're going to take about two and a half, roughly two and a half hours, and we're going to see the old town, the Jewish quarter, and part of the new town of Prague. So basically, most of the major sites uh, in, on this side of the river. Um, and our first thing we're going to check out is this astronomical clock. Did you all get a chance to see it? It is just about the most beautiful 10 seconds of your tour in Prague. And uh, unfortunately, the astronomical clock is on the uh, most overrated tourist attractions in Europe list, which I can't believe because it's beautiful, it's historical, it's you know, a technological marvel if you think about the time when it was built. So what I want to do first is convince you that the Prague astronomical clock is not overrated. <laughs> that is my first goal today. So what we're going to do first is we're going to walk over in front of the clock and I'll tell you a little bit of history and I'll also tell you how to read it. So yes. we can head right on over. History teacher. Oh yeah, you too. What do yep. you teach? What Asian, kind of history? Um, Asian history. Oh, wonderful. Um, well, mainly Philippine history since I'm from the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? 
that are coming here with this clock. So, thanks for considering that. Uh, now, Hanush finished the clock in 1490. And the people in the town hall said, we need to make sure no one else ever gets a clock this wonderful in their city. Because then everyone will leave Prague to go see the new clock. So how are we going to get Hanush to not build a clock like this elsewhere? Now, they put their heads together, they came up with a plan, and they invited Hanush to a banquet one night. And they got him really strong, you know, goulash, levovice, pilsner, you know. Pilsner didn't come around actually until the 1840 <laughs> probably wasn't pilsner. But, um, and he finally said, oh, you guys, I've had a little bit too much, I need to go lie down. They said, don't worry, go sleep it off, we've got a room prepared. And when he went to lay down, the councilman called to these two big burly guys who had been standing in the shadows all night. And they said, you know what to do. So they followed Hanush into the bedroom, and they held him down, and they gouged out his eyes with hot iron pokers, and they cut off his tongue. And that way he couldn't build another clock, and he couldn't tell anyone how to build another clock. Now, he was absolutely, completely pissed off about this turn of events. I mean, you would be, wouldn't you? So he vowed that his dying act would be to get revenge on the city of Prague. So he had his assistant lead him to the top of the inside of the clock. And just as the clock struck the hour one afternoon, he threw himself down into the iron gears of the clockwork and committed suicide. But he did destroy the mechanisms that ran the clock. And it took the city over a hundred years to find someone as skilled as Hanush that could repair it. So he got his revenge. I mean, I don't know, I might rather, you know, have a broken clock than gouged out eyes. I, I don't know who comes out the best in the story. <laughs> that's a brief to decide. But how this show works, uh, every hour from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. the clock goes off and it has been since, you know, that would have been, this, they fixed it, so the 16th century. Uh, there was a small period of time that the clock was destroyed uh, inside because the Nazis actually fired anti-tank grenades into this building. And I'll show you the remains of uh, that they left as a memorial on the other side. So it does have modern clockwork in it today. Horses. Oh, we've got a horse-drawn carriage coming around. So. So the 
the show, you guys. The show every hour. Those two blue doors open up, and we've got six men that file through on each side. And those are the 12 apostles. We've got these four figurines, two on each side. Uh, the skeleton, he represents, of course, death. And the other three represent other fears of medieval fraud. So these two on this side, on the left, are religious. We've got one guy with a mirror. He's thinking he's looking pretty good. He represents the fear of vanity. Then the guy with the money bag over on the right, he represents the fear of greediness. But the final guy on this side, he is actually a military fear in one way. He represents the Ottoman Turkish Empire and the fear that the people had in Central and Eastern Europe of the invasion of the Ottoman Turks, which is a very real fear. They were a hugely powerful empire, especially in the late 15th century. They laid siege to Vienna, which is not far away. Um, also, it represents the fear of the Islamic influence that would come along with the Turkish Empire. So those guys, you know, death starts to ring his bell. Ding, 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 ding. And then the other guys, they start to move their heads. They start to say no, because what do you say to the god of death? Any Game of Thrones fans here? <laughs> not today. So they're saying, not today. Give us another hour. Give us another hour on Earth. And... Then finally, the little chicken at the top of the clock, to finish it off, he goes, er, er. <laughs> that's, that's the show, you guys. It's kind of amazing, in a way, if you think about it. It was built in the 15th century. And this is the only working medieval clock of its type in the entire world. There are two others that survive, but they no longer work as clocks. They're just there as, you know, beautiful pieces of art. Now, to read the clock, we actually have the 24-hour time in two different languages. And the first language is in that dark gray or uh, black circle. That is actually medieval Bohemian, which is a dead language. So I have yet to meet anyone who speaks medieval Bohemian. Um, but then right inside there, you'll probably recognize those, those are Roman numerals, another 24-hour clock in Roman numerals. We also have a smaller circle right in the center with all of the signs of the zodiac. And you can see that there is a sun over there on the right hand side. That sun is over the zodiac sign that the sun is in right now. So that will change about every 28 days or so, but moving into a different phase of the sun. We also have down at the bottom of that circle a nearly completely silver orb and that represents the moon and if you go out and look at the sky tonight that is the phase of the moon in the sky every single day the black covering over that silver orb moves just a little bit and showing the phase of the moon now above the sun and off to the right or my right your left there is actually a golden hand that points to the hour so very literal the hand of the clock <laughs> and then down at the bottom, to the right of the moon, you have a star, and that is the North Star. And the North Star will be at the time that it will rise on the horizon tonight. So if you are an astrologer or an astronomer, ah. and let me tell you, Prague had the largest collection of astronomers, astrologers, scientists, and charlatans in all of Europe around 1500. They just collected them. It's very important that they knew when the North Star would rise. And then last but not least, the background of the clock is several different colors. The black is true astronomical night. So when it is nighttime, uh, the sun actually is going to be in that black sphere. As the sun rises, it moves into the orange, the light blue, and the dark blue. The sun also goes up and down that hand of the clock. So, you are here on Midsummer Day in June. The sun is at the very, very top of that hand, and it spends almost the entire time in the blue and orange part of the sun. If you come in December, during midwinter, the sun is all the way in the middle, and it spends very little time in those blue areas. So it is telling you the time. 
in two different languages. When to expect the North Star to rise, the phase of the moon, how many hours of daylight that you would have, and also the zodiac sign that we're in right now. Does anybody think it's a little bit more impressive now? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> yep. It's absolutely amazing. Now, in the 1800s, they decided to add a second face, and that's the lower one. In the middle, there is the city of the, uh, the symbol of the city of Prague. All three of those towers are still standing. We're going to see one of them today, and the other two are on the Charles Bridge. And then on the outside of that clock is a wonderful Czech tradition. Sometimes people ask, Angela, why did you move to Prague? Well, one, beer is literally cheaper than water. <laughs> yep. And two, you get two birthdays here. You have your birthday and you have your name day. So every single day, this white outer ring turns. And if your name comes up, it is your name day. And your friends will all take you out for a beer. You'll get a little present, maybe some flowers. So it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, tradition here uh, in this part of the So, there yeah, we have the years, but no pointer for the years. Yeah? Yet that is the only thing you must do. But the pointer man on the left side is pointing to the months we actually have. His long pointer is crossing a black field with golden letters. You can read there that the May has 31 days in Latin language. And his pointer is a little bit longer. And it's already near, near already 13. Yeah? But today we have the 12th of May. I think it's just still exactly. And then besides the 12, we have an F. This is the code for the days of the week. Then are following the sense like they were known in the medieval, and then the point is coming from the center. What time information we have there? Four o'clock and zero minutes? Yeah, four o'clock. Four o'clock this morning we had the sun rising at Rostock. Mm. But 1885, nobody could knew that we would introduce the European summer time. So you must add one hour in summer. Yeah? In winter, if you have normal time, the information is correct. So, do a jump with your eyes to the middle, to the central disc. Uh, it's looking like the back bottom of a borrow there. Yeah? Uh, in the left hole you have a 15, in the right hole a 9. Starting up from 4 o'clock we have today 15 hours daylight and 9 hours darkness. Hmm. Hmm. That was the information they need because we had no electricity light and so on. That was important for the people to know how long will be the sun shining. Uh, period for this day. Yeah? yeah, let's look for a year. Everybody could knew. Have a look to nine o'clock position and have a look to the year 1928, please. It's nearly in the level in the middle. 1928. Mm -hmm. On the right side of 1928, you have an H and a G. Four years later, a C and a B. Four years later, again, 1936, an E and a D. So this is the information for the leap years because we have two Sunday letters here. The first letter is for the definition of the Sundays in January and February, and then it changed by 29th of February, then you need the second Sunday letter. So back to 1928. Look to the inner circle, please. There we have an information at date, 8th of April. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the right information. 8th of April, the Easter festival is this year. But when does the Lent start? Seven weeks we have before Easter. Yeah? And when does this start? And the definition for that is before. On the left side of the 8th of April, you can read a <coughs> code eight weeks and two days. In German, acht Wochen, zwei Tage. Eight weeks and two days after the first day of Christmas festivals. The 40 days of Lent are starting. And it ended at the Easter Sunday, the 8th of April. Yeah? Yeah, and uh, yeah, for the Sunday letter is just an example. Uh, tell me please when you was born, and I find out of what day of week my mother, your mother has you born. Okay.